I am. Um, I'm going to talk to you about privacy, and I want to tell you actually first just a little bit about myself and how I got into um, writing about privacy as a journalist. So. Um, I think that oftentimes our own experiences shape a lot of how we view the world, so it's the most truthful way to tell a story is first person, in my opinion. So, um, But I am going to cover all of these topics that I promised you. What do they know? Why does it matter? And what can I do? And I'm also going to hope to leave time for questions, and I'm going to apologize in advance that I'm a very fast talker. <laughs> but hopefully that means you guys will get more questions in. So starting with me, um, I'm an investigative reporter at ProPublica, which is a nonprofit um, journalism institution in New York. I am a born technologist, though, really. I grew up in Palo Alto. This was my first computer, the Apple II. Um, <laughs> some of you may have fond memories of it, as I do. <laughs> I, um, in Palo Alto schools, uh, Apple was doing an experiment teaching kids to program in fifth grade. So I learned my first programming language in fifth grade. And I went on to work at Hewlett Packard and study math at the University of Chicago. And I really thought I was going to have a career in technology until I fell in love with writing. <laughs> and um, my parents have really never <laughs> forgiven me <laughs> for that. But um, I made a decent go of it. And um, I uh, was writing about the technology industry. And I was at the Wall, uh, Wall Street Journal in 2009. And I went and wrote this book, Stealing MySpace, because I had this brilliant idea that social networking was going to be really big, which it totally was. MySpace was the wrong choice <laughs> for a book. <laughs> I should have written my book about Facebook, because <laughs> nobody remembers MySpace. But anyways, it was you know my first book, so mistakes happen. Um, but while I was writing that book, I came across this phenomenon that companies like MySpace and Facebook were really not in the technology business that I knew that I grew up with. They were in the business of sort of monetizing your personal data. And so when I came back to the Wall Street Journal after book leave, I thought to myself, this is a weird new thing. And so I said, I'm going to do an investigation about what do they know. I really just wanted to know what do these people know about me and, wh and who are they selling it to. So I launched a series at the Wall Street Journal called What They Know. And um, in that series, we started with the websites that track your movements, right? So you probably have noticed the ads that follow you around the web. The reason they know that is there's an invis invisible trackers embedded in many web pages that sort of share information with advertisers about the fact that you arrived. Um, so we did a chart. This is a dictionary.com, which basically we found had, uh, I think if you visited 10 pages on the site, there were 200 tracking devices that were enabled on your machine. So tracking was very pervasive. And this is 2010. Um, and we showed how. Um, one woman was what they knew about her. We were uh, managed to get one of the ad tracking companies to tell us what they knew about her just based on the cookie that was placed on her computer, one of these tracking devices, which are anonymous, but they collect a lot of information about where you go across the web. So they knew her favorite movies, they knew she, her age and where she lived, and you know she was very freaked out when I told her what they knew about her. Um, we also tested apps to show how when you put an app on your phone, you don't always realize that it's in communication with the outside world, either with the app maker or with ad companies who have ads inside the app. And we tracked what data they shared with the app. So for instance, some of them would send your age and gender, your location, your phone ID. Um, and so, you know, we, we were just monitoring this commercial surveillance industry. You know, it got, um, I thought it was going to be a one-year investigative project. It grew into a three-year investigative project. Um, we, we looked at, um, these is, this is actually a company that's um, repossession agents. So car repossession agents um, of, are in the business of finding cars that, you know, have outstanding loans and repossessing them. But they had actually gotten into and currently are in the business of surveillance. They realized they're already driving around looking for cars, so they might as well take a picture of every car they go by and build a massive database. <laughs> there are two such nationwide networks of repossession agents who are cruising the streets of, of every city in America with automatic license plate readers that snap the photos of cars that they drive by. And they put a timestamp and a location stamp, and they put it in their database, and then they sell access to that data. And it's publicly available data because your car is sitting on a street somewhere. Um, and so I, we started writing about how you know this was sort of this wild west. Everyone who could gather data was grabbing it as fast as they could. 
of course, we got. We also had to recognize after years of reporting on this, the governments were in this business too. We this is the surveillance catalog. We actually put together brochures from companies who sell surveillance equipment to governments about the types of equipment that were for sale, and you could sort of search this database to see what kind of equipment governments were buying. Of course, there were tools for hacking people and tools for intercepting data and tools for analyzing voice. Um, of course, the story that everybody has heard about is um, Edward Snowden. We did not break that story at the Wall Street Journal. I think everybody knows that um, Edward Snowden went to The Guardian and to Washington Post. But um, that is the story that I think has really awoken people to surveillance on the broad scope of things. And that was a story that was shocking to me as somebody who had been writing about this topic for four years as an investigative reporter, and some of the revelations shocked me. <laughs> and I thought I had reached peak paranoia, and I realized I was under paranoid. <laughs> and I was blown away by that, because that didn't seem like a likely outcome. <laughs> so, um, so I think the National Security Agency revelations have woken everybody up, right? Even the non-paranoid to the fact that surveillance is really um, so ubiquitous now, and it's because the technology is cheap and powerful, right? And by the way, technology being cheap and powerful is greatly beneficial to all of us. I am not giving up my phone or my computer, right? I want all of that benefits of the cheap technology that's powerful. But it, we also are waking up to the fact that it enables massive surveillance. We, you know, some examples of what we learned from Snowden, right? Prism, so all the companies that you do, give your data to are also having to hand it over to the government sometimes. Um, and then, of course, the more shocking revelation to me was the, um, this slide, which was basically, I don't know if you can see the little smiley space SSL added and removed here, but that is essentially the NSA saying we had broken into Google's data center. So not only was the government coming in the front door with court warrants from a secret court saying we need data, but also breaking in through the back door. And that, I think, is one thing that really shocked a lot of people about the NSA revelations. So the logical conclusion from all this is like, oh my god, give up, right? It, privacy is dead. And that's what people say to me all the time. I can't even try. It's too hard. And why should I care? So I'm going to talk about that. So the real question is, why should I care, right? So. I think that that is actually a really hard question to answer because we're at such early days, right? When we first invented canned food, everyone thought this is so awesome. You can have green beans and peaches all year round, right? And that's sort of where we are with technology. It's like I have a phone in my pocket all the time and I can call anytime, anywhere, right? And it, I think it was only after like two decades of making tuna casseroles with cream of mushroom soup that people were like, you know what? Actually, like real mushrooms just taste better, <laughs> right? And I think we're kind of at that point where we're waking up to like, you know, maybe this technology has some great benefits, but we also haven't quite come to like, we don't have a 10 year study of like, what does it do to you to eat cream of mushroom soup every day? And I'm not singling out cream of mushroom soup, it's sort of unfair, but I think that's sort of where we are. And so my answer to the question of like, uh, the unanswered question of harm is actually just a very simple statement that information is power. When you have information about somebody that they, then you have some power over them, right? This is true for parents and this is true when you're buying a used car or a car on the dealer lot. It's true all the time. It's true with your employer. And so when we shed information or when people take our information in ways that we don't know about, they gain some power over us. Now, whether they exercise it or not, we don't know, and in we are, but we are starting to see those stories emerge, right? Of course, I don't know if any of you guys heard about the story this week that was so shocking, but Facebook had manipulated the news feeds of 689,000 people for a week. Half of them saw only happy news from their friends and half of them saw only bad news. Yes, this was a test in order to see if this would affect people's perception of Facebook. But it was also a reminder of the power that Facebook holds, right? They had manipulated our emotions for a week. And that's what, that's what surveillance does. It gives people data, and then they can use that data. And sometimes they'll use it for great things. Hopefully, somebody will cure cancer with data. But we will also see things like this Facebook study, which is causing a huge amount of controversy. Some examples of things that I think, and I'm worried about uh, with privacy, this is, a comp this is actually a car dealership we wrote about called, that was, um, when you sent in an email to set up a test drive, they actually used some information, they did some really 
tricky technology to figure out what websites you had previously visited. And then by the time they got to the lot, they already knew what car you were looking for and what prices you had seen. And so once again, you're negotiating leverage. This is a very clear case where you might not want them to know that when you get to the lot. Um, they were later fined by the Federal Trade Commission. Um, this is a guy who went to the Capital One website, and I don't think you guys can see, but in there's some green code up there. The code that went back and forth from his computer when he went to the website, it went back and forth instantaneously, and it diagnosed him as a downscale income person with some college and gave him a mid-level card. That was the first card showed to him. Now, if he went deeper into the site, he would see other cards, and he certainly could apply for any card he want. But that instantaneous judgment was done just by the data that automatically transmitted from his computer to the Capital One website. And that is like the bare minimum of data that can be known about you. Um, whoops. We looked at Staples. Staples actually was pulling that same information and giving different prices on all of its office supplies by zip code. And this is currently true, by the way. All of you can go test this. They still do it. It's perfectly legal. But um, this is a map of Iowa. And the dark green is the people who get high prices. The light green is, lighter, is lower prices. And so for instance, a stapler um, would vary in price from $14.29 to $15.79 in the two different price ranges. It has nothing to do with shipping costs. It's simply their analysis of your ability to shop at a competitor's store. So what they did is they mapped every zip code and how close it was to a competitor store, like an Office Max or an Office Depot. And the people who were near a competitor store would get a cheaper price. And so in some very basic business way, this makes sense, right? This is the competition. But what's also disturbing about it is that the people who live near competitor stores also just happened, we ran the census data, to be whiter and more high income. So you're essentially giving higher prices to lower income people. And that's the unfortunate result of this type of price discrimination. And economists will debate all day about whether price discrimination is good or bad, and some people will make very compelling arguments that it's the right way to do pricing. But I think that as a society, we have to think about how far we're willing to let it go. right? And the problem is we don't know how much is this is happening. These studies are very hard to do. This took me nine months and two computer programmers to do. So we don't, I don't know how many people ask me how widespread is this. I'm like, I'm trying to do another study, but it's going to take me another year and two more programmers. <laughs> and so you know, I can't tell you if this is how, how widespread this is. Now, on the government side, there's also terrible things that can happen with your data, right? This is, of course, the worst story. But basically, you know, a SWAT team went to the wrong house because they had a search warrant looking for drugs, and they um, blew through a grenade into um, this little boy's crib. He's still in intensive care, actually. Um, he was burned severely. Uh, they throw these grenades to, they're stun grenades or something, but anyways. Um, the problem is that we, when the government has data about you and it's the wrong data, the consequences are worse, right? <laughs> That's my point here. And you know, the worst, con w the one that is the most egregious right now to me is the no-fly list because the no-fly list is a is an in a database that you don't ever know what data got you into it, and it has been you will never see the data that was used against you. So this woman is the only woman who's ever been able to litigate and get her way off the list, but she herself was never able to see the underlying data or to contest it. And to me, that violates our constitutional right to due process. And so we have some due process issues around our data, uh, particularly with the government use of it. So those are the kinds of harms that we've seen so far from mass surveillance. Um, I suspect that this is the beginning and that we don't really know the full array. But I hope that um, it has convinced you there are some harms out there. And I will say that my final and most my most biggest concern is actually about what it does to us as a free society. So once you kind of know that your data is out there and it's being monitored to change prices, or maybe the government's going to look and see if you're a terrorist, it has a chilling effect. There hasn't been enough study of this, but the best study so far is this Helsinki privacy experiment. They went and asked 10, peop 10 uh, households to allow themselves to be surveilled ubiquitously. They had video cameras, um, computer monitoring, uh, phone monitoring, they had um, TV monitoring. And these people opted in to a research study. They knew the data was going to be used benignly by researchers to understand the impacts of surveillance. And what happened was that it was very stressful at the beginning. 
And then they started to adapt. And they had little increases of stress when like a friend came over who didn't understand that there was surveillance or whatever. But in the end, what they found was people really just self-censored. They basically induced behavioral changes of habituation where they didn't talk about controversial things and they didn't express um, controversial ideas. They went and hid in the bedroom, which was the one room that wasn't monitored, or they left the house. And I just feel like in a world, that's not a world I want to live in, right? Because right now, surveillance, if you think about it, is everywhere. It's in our home, it's outside of our home. And so do I want to be in a world where I'm sort of s constantly dragging my husband into a bathroom somewhere to have a conversation that's private? And I'm worried about that because I find that the more I know about privacy and surveillance issues, the less willing I am to communicate in email. My boss is always saying, why don't you ever respond to emails? Well, I don't want any data trail, right? I myself am censoring myself. And I worry, so that's my biggest concern about the harms of surveillance is the, what kind of society we'll live in with self-censorship. So, um, and, I, and I think that that's, you know, I have to say a nod to Snowden is that he sort of seemed like the one who really, that was so salient for him. Because kids of his age, I shouldn't say kids, young people, <laughs> millennials, <laughs> um, live on the internet, right? That's their whole world. And so I think it was, it sounds to me like this quote he had, I don't want to live in a world where everything I say, everything I do, everyone I talk to, every expression of creativity or in love and friendship is recorded. I think that for his generation, this was an, you know, this, it seems like his motivating force. And you can agree or disagree with what he did about it. But the one thing I would point out is, not very many people have clicked the donate now. Because you know, I looked at this website and I think that it's actually kind of a risky move, right? Who's gonna go leave a digital data trail on the free Edward Snowden page? <laughs> like, you know, that is the thing that actually I most felt about this. I was like, I'm not clicking that, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, that's the shortest route to the no-fly list. So, <laughs> So I felt like this site was illustrative on both of those points. And it sort of made me realize that's the concern I have about it, is the self-censorship it creates. So then the question is, OK, if you buy into my idea that there are harms, and people don't buy into it, everybody, and there are great benefits to big data and surveillance that we can also talk about. But if you buy into the fact that we want to mitigate some of the risks of the downsides, what can you do? So what I did is I wrote a book that came out in February, Dragnet Nation. In the course of reporting it for a year, I tried my best to mitigate my privacy risks. I did not get up, give up my phone. I did not give up my computer. I still am a working mother with two kids. I did not live in a shed in the woods, whatever. I wanted to live in the modern world and see what was possible. What was it possible to do without becoming a complete freak? So um, the first thing I did was I had to deal with Google. Because Google, I love those guys, right? I mean, they're, you know, they're like right down the street from me in Palo Alto where I grew up. And um, I wrote about them when I was at the San Francisco Chronicle many years ago when they launched. And I had no bad feelings in particular about Google, but they knew so much about me that it was crazy, right? I went and looked. They have, I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but if you have Gmail, which most of you probably do, they also have a record called Web History, which you can see every website you've ever visited. And they've logged it. So I went and looked at mine. It dates back. They had everything stored back to 2006. And you know, it was a typical day. I woke up. Well, I'm a privacy reporter. So my first search of the day was for a uh, one-time pad, which is a type of cryptographic code. Um, and then I went to Open Table to look for a restaurant reservation. Then I actually went and looked some shoes. <laughs> and then I went back to the New York Times dining section. And then I went back to my cryptography. But you know, it's sort of embarrassing, right? Like, I'm supposed to be a serious person here. And they have a record <laughs> of where my mind is going, which is not entirely on cryptography. And so um, I, and I was really annoyed because Google is sort of into this openness thing, but they won't let me download this data. So they let you keep certain data, but they won't let you download your search history. And when I looked through my search history, I thought it was the most revealing thing I had ever seen. And I also wanted it. It was very visceral. I was just like, I want this data. I want it. Because I kind of felt like it was the ultimate Fitbit, right? I would see where my mind was going, and maybe I would realize that every day at 3, I started having these shoe problems and starting searching for shoes. And if I could just have coffee at that time, I would stop searching for shoes. But no, <laughs> I can't make that decision for myself. And maybe Google has, right? So that's also worrying to me, is they know that about me, but I don't know it about me. And that's sort of the fundamental unfairness of this privacy equation. The other thing is that Google is always reading your mind, right? This is a search I did in a hotel room in DC. Now, I live in New York. 
So they were like, oh, hello, Julia. We know you're looking for the DC Natural History Museum, but we also know you live in New York, so we'll give you the New York as the next one, right? And that is how Google works. That's why they're, that they use information about you to tailor and to help you. And this is actually helpful, right? But it also is creepy because what if I was looking for the one in London? Who knows? And so I decided that I just wanted to leave Google search. This, I felt, was the most invasive part of Google. So I went to DuckDuckGo, which is a search engine that is, doesn't keep any logs. So they don't know who I am. When I search for a natural history museum, they do give me the one in London. <laughs> They're like, we don't know who you are. They don't keep any information. They, don't, they strip out the identifying location details uh, um, before my, my query even hits their computers. And they promise not to um, collect any information about me. And I find what I need. Now, look, I have to type not New York, right? I have to write those two extra words after Natural History Museum. But I have decided that that is not too high a price to pay, right? I realized how lazy I had become. I was letting Google just fill in everything for me. And I was like, OK, I can write those two words. I can write New York. Uh, leaving Gmail was harder. It's a great service. Um, and there are not very many privacy protecting email services out there um, because it's really hard to do. I joined one that I cannot wholeheartedly recommend because it is um, lovely, it rise up, but it is an anarchist collective in Seattle. And you have to agree to their mission statement, which says that you are against um, gender oppression, capitalist oppression, and several other types of oppression, which I decided I was against. But I also felt at the time working for the Wall Street Journal, whose tagline was Adventures in Capitalism, <laughs> that <laughs> I was probably parsing my words very carefully on the capitalist part. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I joined. And they have a very small quota, because actually storing data on their servers is a big risk for them. The government can come ask for it. So I have to download all my email onto my own machine. So I, I would just say that I can't wholeheartedly recommend this for people who don't want to do that. However, I would really like it if Google would actually just offer a privacy protecting email service. I would pay for it, no problem, right? I don't see why they have to sell those ads that read your email and then place the ad next to it based on what you wrote. But as of yet, they don't have that. Um, then I went through the very sad process of unfriending everybody on Facebook. Um, I decided I needed to keep a Facebook page just because I'm an author and a journalist and I needed to be able to be found. But I, was, I don't like the fact that your friend list is very revealing about you and it can be viewed. It is not possible to fully make that list private. Um, if you have a mutual friend with someone, then that friend is exposed to both of you. That's the same on LinkedIn. And for me, particularly as a journalist, I don't want either sources or people who th would be suspected of being my sources to be revealed in that way. And so I just don't feel like it's responsible for me to have an open social network like that. Um, so I unfriended everyone, including my mother, who was really annoyed. And, um, <laughs> and I just have a page that says, Julia is not often found here. <laughs> you can read about her. It's complicated relationship with Facebook on her blog. And, you know, um, and then I deleted my LinkedIn page, which actually caused me a lot of heart palpitations, because I did actually spend a s a, a several weeks wondering if I would ever get a job again. <laughs> right? But actually, um, since that time, I have left the Wall Street Journal and joined ProPublica without, the ben without any guidance from LinkedIn. So it seems like it worked out. Um, and then I went on to browsing. So I did. Um, I wanted to block all this online ad tracking that where the ads follow you around because I feel that's really unfair. I um, am perfectly willing to look at ads, but I don't see why they need to know everything about where I've been on the internet. Um, so I use something called White Hat Aviator, which is a web browser with a bunch of anti-tracking tools built in. It's, um, but you can also just add these tools to your existing browser. So um, the tool that they have built in is called Disconnect, which is turns off all the advertising tracking and you can sort of turn on the face you can see F G and T those are Facebook Google and Twitter you can turn on and off those tracking if you really like those little things that show you your friends are reading this or whatever on some page you can allow it um, and then I also do um, you can also install on your web browser HTTPS everywhere which basically encrypts the connection between your computer and the internet and that's very important if you're sitting in a cafe or even on the campus here um, you wouldn't want another user who's sophisticated to be s intercepting your traffic unencrypted as you log in somewhere and get your passwords so I recommend that for everybody um, that goes on all of the browsers so you don't have to use white hat um, and then if you want to be super, super um, secure and private, the, the best browser for that is Tor. But it is um, 
a browser that you download onto your computer. It's, a, it's not that hard to set up, but basically it routes your traffic through other internet addresses. So when I'm sitting in New York, I'm actually browsing the internet through Amsterdam. So that means two things. Sometimes the websites show up in Dutch, and <laughs> sometimes the web surfing is really slow. But the, tr the nice thing is they don't know who you are, <laughs> so it's very anonymous, but a little inconvenient. Um, I also went to an encrypted cloud instead of Google's Drive um, because I didn't want to store my documents with Google. Um, I pay $200 a year, unfortunately, for this, so um, this does get pricey, protecting your privacy. Um, but this Spider Oak service is very good. It encrypts on my machine and transmits encrypted and um, is also, unfortunately, slightly slower than the non-encrypted alternatives. <laughs> um, and then there's encrypted communication. So if you can convince anybody in your life to com communicate with you encrypted, that's great. And then they can install these tools. I have failed to get anyone to do <laughs> this except for like cryptographers <laughs> that I communicate with. Um, my husband was like, are you kidding? That is not happening. <laughs> um, my kids are sort of willing to do it because it's secret codes. So they're like, oh, that sounds cool, except they kind of then don't really do it. Um, but these are the two main programs that I would recommend. GPG Tools is something you would install for to encrypt your email. Pigeon is an instant messaging encryption program. Um, and then my final frontier of privacy was I created a fake identity. <laughs> um, I, um, I felt. <laughs> This is Ida Tarbell. She's a journalistic uh, heroine of mine. She was a muckraking journalist at the turn of the century. She wrote a series of um, groundbreaking articles about Standard Oil showing their abuse of their monopoly, which led to their breakup eventually. Um, and I wanted uh, a fake identity because I realized that I still couldn't do certain things, mostly commerce. I could not buy things unless I was willing to do cash. All transactions, credit or online, involve transmission of your identity. And so I thought, you know what? I can solve this problem. So I got Ida, an American Express card. Um, <laughs> it's really awesome, actually, and super easy to do. I added her to my account as if she was a kid. So uh, American Express knows I'm paying Ida's bills. And they're fine. As long as they get the check every month, they don't care, right? Um, but the nice thing is it just allows me that veneer of anonymity when I do credit transactions at a restaurant or at a store. Um, I just don't have to give up all my information. And no one has ever asked or heard of Ida Tarbell, apparently, because I use it everywhere. Um, and Ida also has an Amazon account, because I also wanted, I order so many books about cryptography, Stasi, the NSA history, you know, every sort of secret police, you know, I'm, and I thought, you know, this is also going to land me on the list. So Ida orders those books on her Amazon account, and they go to my friend's address, <laughs> who has donated her address to Ida. Um, and Ida also reserves restaurants on open tables. So she has a great life. Um, <laughs> So, so those were the successful parts of my privacy strategy. I did have some unsuccessful parts. So um, I tried to get out of all the data brokers. Those guys who, if you ever Googled your name, which I'm sure you never have, but um, you see that people sell information like, oh, get so-and-so's records for $1.95. All of those guys, there are data brokers who basically buy and sell lists of people's name, address, property records, criminal convictions, and they sell access to it. And I wanted out of it. However, they are not required by law to give you anything, access to your data. Um, they're not required to let you opt out. So I identified 212 data brokers, and that took me a month just to compile that list. Of those, only 92 offered me an opt out. 65 wanted me to present ID to opt out. Some of them wanted um, me to send my driver's license. One of them wanted a credit card. I was like, no, sorry, we're not opting out of that one. Um, and only 33 would s let me see my data. And of those, I really only managed to obtain 13 because they made it so hard to get the data. So um, that was a really uh, depressing exercise. In the end, I found that I removed myself from sort of the better players. So if you look for me on Spokio, I'm not there. But then some other sites, I still exist because they don't have an opt out, right? So this is an industry where the bad players are incentivized, right? My data is now scarce, and they have it. So the bad actors win. And that's an unfortunate result, in my opinion. Um, the other place that I totally failed at was my cell phone. So cell phones are like the perfect tracking device, right? You have it with you all the time. Probably you keep it near your bed. Um, and it's transmitting all the time. And you can't see who it's transmitting to. 
and you don't know. I mean, it's definitely talking to the cell towers, but it also talks to the local Wi-Fi. It probably sends data all the time to Apple and Google, whichever one you have, and then the apps are sending data. And you have no idea when and how this data is being transmitted. This, by the way, Verizon is their, this, this slide is actually from their um, service selling uh, location data of their customers. I don't know if you knew they had a business selling that, but they aggregate all the information about their inform where customers are located in real time and sell that information anonymous, like you're not identified, but still, that rankles me because I'm paying them a lot of money, actually. Um, then there's the people who sniff your Wi-Fi. So this is a conference for this emerging industry of people who set up little stations that can just sort of identify your phone as it walks by a Wi-Fi hotspot. So I have turned off Wi-Fi entirely on my phone, which is annoying, because, but the truth is I just don't want to be identified by all these Wi-Fi sniffing. A lot of retailers are doing it, shopping malls, they're like, oh, we want to see what shop people's patterns as they walk through the store and which displays they stop at. But the truth is they get your actual, like sort of a s equivalent of your serial number for your phone, and so you're very identified to them. And they know who, you know, they don't know who you are, but they know um, a lot about you because that's a number that never changes. So anytime your phone comes back, they'll see that it's you. Um, I use some encrypted apps on my phone, but I once again couldn't find anyone else to correspond with me on them. <laughs> it's very sad. Um, so I had to get Ida a phone. <laughs> so Ida has her own phone it, under her own credit card <laughs> number. And um, yeah, this is all starting to get rather expensive, I would just like to point out, right? So <laughs> she has her own plan. It's a prepaid phone. But it's also, it was also <laughs> a complete failure because, you know, my husband was like, I don't understand which phone am I calling today? Are you Ida? Like, and there's all these mishaps with the babysitter. And it was just like, <laughs> it turned out that running two identities, there's a reason like the CIA guys go to some special camp to learn how to do this. It's not so easy. So in the end, I would say that my phone thing was a total failure. And now I just put it in this really sad little bag to block all signals when I don't want to be tracked. So it's a Faraday cage. It's basically a pouch lined with thin, you can actually wrap it in tin foil. It works, but it's super embarrassing. So <laughs> I paid for that. <laughs> I did do it, but then I was like, this is just too awful. So I put it in this bag that's like lined with thin f metal. And, um, and so if I'm like meeting a source or I'm just basically, you know, I don't want to be tracked, I put my phone in that, which also by the way means can't get any calls. I'll take questions at the end. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and so this was, I say, I would say this is a failure of privacy protection. Okay, the whole cell phone thing was a failure. So in the end, what did I learn? What I learned was I couldn't get out of the data markers. I couldn't really control the data that flowed out of my phone. I couldn't get any of my friends to use encryption. And I also didn't really know if the tools I was using worked, right? Even if I did have encrypted communications with somebody, I had no assurances that was working. Or the apps that I bought, the Spider Oak encrypted cloud. You know, I went and met with the guys and I looked them in the eye and they seemed trustworthy, but like, I don't know. It could be not really true, right? And so I also felt like there was an opportunity here for a lot of, um, there could be a lot of companies that were misleading. And in fact, I did have two companies I did business with. I bought services from two companies that said they would opt me out of data brokers, and both of them failed to deliver on that promise and um, had to refund me the money. And it was only because I'm an investigative reporter that I knew that. I think other people would have just paid. So I really started to feel like, look, privacy was becoming a luxury good that I ended up spending, with between the cloud and the burner phone and this and that, I added everything up, it was uh, more than $2,000. And that's a lot of money. So I was like, this is something only some people can buy. And then in the other part of it, it's actually sort of weirdly deceptive, right? It's not even clear that I'm getting anything. So it's like a luxury market without any standards. And so I felt at the end that um, I had some successes. My successes were more on the web and the computer browsing stuff um, and in the real life of the actual the credit card. But um, on the phone and the data brokers, I felt like more collective action is probably needed. Those are parts of that, even with extraordinary effort, that an individual can't control. Um, so anyways, a little plug for my book. And everything that I just talked about, which I know went by really fast, is on my website, Privacy Tools. So you can read about them all. Um, and I did talk fast, so good. We have time for questions. So I saw there was one right here. Uh, she's, he's coming with the microphone. As a result of all this stuff that you've done, have you noticed a change in stuff that pops up on your computer, uh, 
is there anything that sort of, I suppose there's some funny stories. Oh, you mean how my personal like life experience of in, in living other words, this way? How has your life changed? Right. Because you've done all this stuff. Well, my stuff. life is, you know what's interesting about it is that my life is more inconvenient, right? It's definitely more inconvenient. So I, um, I didn't even talk about passwords, but all my passwords are 40 characters long, and I use this weird manager system. And so whenever I need to log in somewhere, I have to do some, I have to open up my encryption file, and then I have to copy and paste. And it's, it's much more inconvenient than having the same password across all sites that I used to have. <laughs> um, and that's true for web browsing. Like with DuckDuckGo, I have to type in more things, and sometimes I have to look a little harder for things. But the, what, I've, what I've decided about this is actually, I re, the reason I mentioned food early on is it's like going to a farmer's market. I feel like I'm being more thoughtful about my technology choices, and so it's like I actually enjoy the process. It's sort of, I like picking out my tomato, you know? I am like sort of choosing my tools in a way that makes me feel good about the choices I'm making and that I'm voting by doing it this way, it's, it's more of a, it's a political point, you know? DuckDuckGo has had their traffic go up dramatically since Snowden's revelations, and I think that it's one way to show our lawmakers that we care about this issue. So my life is a little more inconvenient, but the truth is that the most inconvenient stuff I stopped doing. <laughs> um. I have three quick questions. Yeah. The Microsoft just recently announced they were encrypting Hotmail. The black phone, yep. Google um, encrypting data between data centers, yep. and incognito uh, browsing on Google. So great things have been happening on encryption front, right? So one of the things about that slide that I showed you where the NSA had broken into the Google data center is it really made the tech companies mad. And so they are now encrypting everything, which is great. It's great for us as users. One reason I switched to Rise Up was because they had already encrypted all connections along the way and the files at rest and in transit. And now that's becoming the standard practice. But when I switched, it wasn't the standard practice. So that is a great outcome, actually, from these revelations, is that those companies are trying to fight for consumer trust, and they should. Um, I will say this, though. Incognito is only good for one thing. Incognito prevents the other person who's using your computer from seeing where you went. It does not prevent the places you w are going from tracking you. So incognito is designed to basically flush the cookies so that the next person who uses the computer doesn't see the trail of where you were. But while you're browsing in incognito, there are inc numbers and numbers of methods that can circumvent it, um, mostly fingerprinting and IP address, and, um, and they're pretty widely used these days. So I don't recommend incognito unless your threat model is your spouse, <laughs> which it is for some people, <laughs> yes. Uh, do all these sites, can they know what your password is for the different accounts or different things you have? Uh, no. So most uh, most of the tracking that I'm talking about is not criminal hacking, where they, criminal hackers will try to get your passwords. Um, the commercial tracking, the commercial data gatherers are trying to figure out where you're going. They're not trying to get your passwords. The reason I say to use encryption, though, this HTTPS everywhere in particular, is that there are a lot of criminal hackers out there, and we are all being targeted by them. I'm sure everyone here has a story of someone they know who has had a hacking attempt. And so the best defense against that is to encrypt using this HTTPS everywhere so that whenever you're using an untrusted internet connection, your connection to the internet is encrypted. And the other thing is to have really great passwords. And I have a huge amount to say about passwords that's super boring, but basically if there's one thing you should know, <laughs> that your email password is the most important because it can be used to reset all your other accounts. You know how when you say forgot password, they email it to you? So your email password is, if you're gonna do one password, has to be that strong, that one. And I would recommend 40 characters long. Yes, 40 characters. Now, I'm sorry that is long, but there are ways to do it. Just do a pass, your favorite song lyric um, with a few underscores and an exclamation point. It's possible to do. The way I do it is pick random words out of the dictionary. And I pay my daughter to do it because I'm lazy. Um, so she, um, there's a special dictionary which has all the, wor let num all the words are numbered. And she rolls dice, she picks them randomly for me, and then I can actually remember them. And she will sell them. Also, she has a password business. <laughs> she sells them for a dollar a piece. It's adorable. <laughs> um, so I have all the details about that also on my website. On your phone, um, 
No. Mm, yeah, some there's definitely some hacking techniques to get that, but you shouldn't. Um, I wouldn't reckon, worry about that as your first. The most important thing is your Gmail password and your email password and then banking. Those are your two to worry about. And the rest of it, I would just say put that on, like, the second tier for when you want to get really crazy about it, like I am. You said email, password, and banking. Banking. Yes. Well, I would just say that I would also make banking as long as possible. The problem with the banking websites is they don't usually let you go to 40 characters. So you have to make it as long as you can. Oh, sorry. We need all the questions on the mic. So where's the mic now? Okay. Um, how do you deal with the fact that um, sometimes when you take steps to make yourself anonymous, you can you make yourself a target? In other words, you know, yes. we've heard the National Security Agency treating Tor as being suspect, right? And presumably they treat other attempts to make yourself private being suspect, and so you try and be private, and as a result, you're targeted more. Yes, correct. So I um I dealt with that initially. I had to make a decision about how to do that, and I decided that. I went into this knowing that using encryption, using Tor, um, and probably having a fake <laughs> a credit card <laughs> um, was probably going to raise some flags. And what I've decided is that I'm okay with that because I checked out the legality of all of these things. They are all entirely legal. And I am doing it not for any improper purposes. And I also feel that it's a little bit of civil disobedience. I want to register my protest with mass surveillance. I am not a terrorist. I am not a suspect. I do not need to be surveilled by the NSA. I don't think they should be watching me. And so I basically view it as a form of protest in addition to hopefully working a little bit. Uh, the mic's up back there. Okay. Yes. Uh, just a quick question. Two-step verification. Do you think that that is good or is it? I, um, I think two-step ver verification is great. I don't use it myself because I'm so crazy with my passwords um, and I don't like to always have my have to have my phone with me because usually the second step of the verification is your phone and because I have it in a Faraday cage or I'm using the, <laughs> the fake phone or whatever, I don't always have that second step with me. But I think for most people who are not um, at the level of you know, <laughs> privacy protection that I'm at. Um, Two-step is a great thing to do. The one thing I don't like is when they ask for your phone number. Um, Twitter, I think, asks for your phone number and they want to text it to you each time. I don't think that's best practice. I think it's better to have the app that you control the data access. Are there any companies, uh, the one-stop shopping companies, where you pay them a bunch of money and they do all of this for you? I, you know, Recommend I wish, any of them? I wish there was, actually. Um, but what's weird about this market is there's a lot of like reputation management companies that will sort of try to clean up your search results and make you look better when people search for you online. But in terms of privacy protection, the truth is that everything I did is so crazy hard and sort of unverifiable that I think most companies are thinking this isn't going to be worth it. Um, but I would say there's been a huge rise in privacy protecting services like the black phone, which I failed to mention earlier. But this is a new phone that really only transmits over Wi-Fi and, so, and encrypted. And so the idea is that um, you would be not caught in the NSA's surveillance net because you know, the, the database they were collecting was from the cell phone carriers about your calling records. So it would be a way to avoid that. But it also has other risks of communicating only by Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, I just had a follow-up on that last yes. point. But first, um, the, the line I heard about Facebook was that if you're not paying for a product, you are the product. Yeah. But m moving on, on, on the uh, privacy services, it seems like there's a real tension um, that you were describing earlier between yourself and these companies. But there's also a real tension between these companies and the federal government. I mean, preceding the Snowden affair, uh, the hush mail affair in, in uh, Canada was a big deal where yep. – the feds basically seized the data and were stealing people's email. Right. And and so are you seeing in your investigative research some of these companies that are privacy focused and coming up being snuffed out by the by the feds essentially? Well and, yeah, I mean and, that's and, the story of what, Lavabit. What's, what's the counter force, I guess? Yep. So that was the story of Lavabit, which you may or may not know about, but this was Snowden's email provider in Texas. And they actually had to shut down. Right? The government came to them with a warrant that they thought was too broad because it would have unlocked the communications of all of their members, not just Snowden's. And so they actually shut down their service rather than comply with that. But that's an extreme position. And so this is the challenge I had with Rise Up. So joining Rise Up, you know, they said, look, uh, if the government comes to us with that thing, we might shut down. So like, you better store your email 
at home <laughs> and download it on your computer. So I sort of joke that I've become like a data survivalist, right? I'm stock stockpiling my data at home and I'm like, I'm ready, you know? <laughs> and like, I don't think this is actually the world we want to live in, right? And so I think that more transparency um, around uh, these kinds of requests, I mean, they certainly, it's, I'm all in favor of law enforcement being able to come and get bad guys. And so I think the question that we as a society need answered though is, um, they're not transparent about how broad these requests are. That was the sh that was the shock of the phone database that it was every call, not just terrorist calls, right? Or that Prism collected 20 million con transactions a year. Is that every? Is that all terrorists? Or is that ins you know they won't say how much of it is U.S. innocent people? I think if there was trust in the system, and they were transparent and were like, look, we're just getting the bad guys, and like our tr requests are tailored, and we're doing it in a narrow way, I think people would be willing to agree, but we haven't seen that evidence yet. I would say the analogy I often use for this is cars. So cars are really dangerous, and we get in them and we drive them every day. The reason we do that is two things. One, we know there's a baseline safety standard they have to meet. And two, we know if anything goes wrong, we can sue the pants out of them, right? And that they're going to get in trouble with the government and have to go cry in front of Congress, et cetera, right? And so we don't have that with our data. We don't have a baseline standard, nor do we have any sort of due process rights about our data once it's out of our hands. And so I think if we had those two things, I actually feel like I would be a very willing participant in this information economy because it has great benefits. But I, we just don't have those standards yet. I'm always trying to justify <coughs> why I continue to have a BlackBerry in an iPhone <laughs> world. But I've, one of the reasons my IT guy has always said is that it's a much more secure system. Is, that, is there any truth That's to that? That's absolutely true. Um, it, was, it was more true when BlackBerry was a really stable company. <laughs> um, but yes, they invested in, 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 because of their corporate clients, they actually invested heavily in encryption and they had a lot of default encryption and they didn't, um, as far as we know, we don't. We, they weren't handing over access to wholesale to governments, but we don't know that for sure. But we we think that, and so um, they gave the keys to unlock the data only to the company. They themselves didn't have it, which is the best practice. So one thing I always look for in a privacy protecting service is: Do I have the keys to unlock it, or do they have it? Because if I have it, then that's great. I have control. But if they have it, then I won't. I really don't control my data. But the other side of that coin is: I can't forget my password. Right? Because if they don't have the keys to unlock it, then you can never lose your passwords. So that's another reason I have them written down on pieces of paper, <laughs> and I keep them in my desk, and I also have them written down another place. And so um, once I have the keys, I also have the responsibility to you know, be really responsible with those keys. OK, three quick things. Um, biometrics, Google Glass, the EU uh, opt-out decision. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh. OK, so I would say on biometrics, I'm very concerned about facial recognition technology because uh, the companies, for instance, that were doing the tailored pricing online when you come in, well, once they get facial recognition and you walk into the store and the camera there identifies you as by your net worth, and all of a sudden you get good service or you get bad service, that's coming. That is the dream of retailers. They have articles in their trade literature about it. And also, they want to identify you as a shoplifter or somebody bad. And I just feel like either way, I'm going to lose. Like either way, they're, they're either going to decide I'm a shoplifter and throw me out, or they're going to decide I'm really ex only like expensive things and only show me expensive things, and I'll never see the sale rack. And so I kind of just have this feeling that that's not going to work well for me. Uh, the Google decision about um, the right to be forgotten, though, that is a very challenging decision. Because I, as a privacy advocate, I'm like, I love privacy. I want to control my data. But you know what I don't want? I don't want the pedophiles in my neighborhood to be able to erase their past. And so I'm very torn about that ability to erase information in the public view. I'm not sure I can totally support it. Um, I think we have time for one more. Oh, Google Glass. I'll talk about Google Glass. So Google Glass the concerns me mostly because of facial recognition. It's going to be added. Um, already there have been some rogue apps that tried to add it. Um, Google has said they're not going to let uh, facial recognition into the app. You know, that's going to last about five minutes. Uh, what do you think the future holds for privacy? Do you think that concern and outrage by citizens will change the landscape, or do you think this will just get worse? I'm very optimistic. I believe that we have solved all sorts of problems in the past. You know, there was a time when the Cuyahoga River caught fire every year from pollution in Ohio. And um, we uh, lived with it for a long time. And then all of a sudden, we were like, you know what? This is lame. Our river shouldn't be catching fire from pollution. And we passed laws. And we also 
didn't just pass laws. We also changed our own behavior. We started recycling. We started picking up dog poop on the sidewalk, right? So we changed as a nation. Over the past 50 years, we've like made huge progress on the environment. And I see privacy as a very similar problem. It's a collective problem. It, it's all of our problems. It's a similar in the fact that it's hard to attribute the harm. If you have cancer, you can't say it's just, even if you live down from a factory, you can't say it's their fault. Same problem with privacy. The harm that happens to you, you can't always attribute it to a particular piece of data. And so I feel like we have solved these kind of collective problems before, and I have hope that we will in the future. Are we done? OK, we are done. I'm sorry, I'm going to speak um, in the next auditorium in 10 minutes. So come see me again. <laughs>